Today on this episode, we've got Paul Lutter, who is a private money lender in the real estate space. Um, we love to talk to private money lenders because um, lots of our audience is always asking me through text, emails, direct messages, on every possible way. How do I get money for my deal, James? How do I get money? I want to invest in real estate, but I don't know how to get the money. So we, we've we been doing a little bit of leaning towards uh, those kinds of co-hosts, so to speak, or guests. And because we want to put the word out and, and, and give people examples of, hey, this is what you got to do to get money in the real estate space. This is who you got to become. This is the kind of things you need to bring to the table. And we're going to get it right from the horse's mouth today because Paul Lutter is a lender. So, Paul, thank you for showing up today. Yeah, for sure, James. Thanks for uh, asking me to come on. You and I spoke uh, a couple of weeks back and, uh, man, I really enjoyed that conversation. Um, and, and I really enjoy lending, too. So we'll, uh, I'm sure, get into more of the lending side and a little bit of my story. But, you know, thanks again for, for asking me and giving me the opportunity to be here today. Absolutely. Right on the front end. How do people get in touch with you so we could add that in the show notes? Sure. Uh, Instagram, you can hit me up at underscore Paul Lutter, or you can find me on Facebook, uh, Paul M. Lutter. Uh, or, uh, yeah, those are probably the best two ways to get a hold of me. Okay. So let's jump right in. And this is something that is always interesting. Why don't you give us a little meandering through your life of, let's say, where were you 10 years ago? And how did you get to where you, you're now lending money in real estate? How did that come about? Yeah, so 10 years ago, that's what, uh, 2014. Um, I was more than halfway through my military career at that point. Um, I was a practicing physician assistant specializing in orthopedic surgery. Um, so you can think of that kind of like wood shop for the body. Uh, I fixed, helped people fix broken bones, uh, all of their sports injuries uh, for the active duty population. And so at that point in my life, uh, I had no real interest in anything outside of the military or healthcare. Um, I had trained my entire life up to that point uh, to have a career in medicine. And I, I was really focusing on what my life outside of the military was going to look like because I had about four or five years left uh, in my mind in the military before I was going to retire and hop into private practice. So uh, that happened in uh, mid to late 2018. Um, I grew up in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And so once my wife and I retired from the military, we moved back to the DFW area and immediately hit the ground running uh, in a private practice job in orthopedic surgery um, and immediately knew that I needed to find another career. Um, the reality of the civilian healthcare system, uh, where physician assistants kind of land within that hierarchy um, and the realities of the profession, it, it just was not in line with what I had experienced in the military um, and really what I wanted to continue to do. My passion to help people was still there, but the business of healthcare changed the delivery of healthcare um, and my ability to truly make a difference in people's lives. Um, so the, uh, the quality I felt was, was compromised in the ability to deliver healthcare. And so I tried to make it work the best I could for about three years. Uh, and during that time, I was trying to figure out what the next step was going to be. Cause again, I had never really pictured or envisioned anything for myself outside of the healthcare space. And so, uh, I had reached out to somebody that, uh, you know, I knew from my younger years who did something similar and that they got to a point in their lives. It was not what they thought it was going to be. And they completely changed everything. Uh, and they had some success in, in real estate. So I just kind of asked, Hey, what did you do? And, and what do you recommend I should do? Um, and the recommendation was, you know, get into some local real estate meetup rooms, shake some hands, meet some people, ask lots of questions, read lots of books, um, and just start a new path of education uh, in real estate. And so that's what I did. Um, not really knowing what that was going to look like for me. Uh, I thought based on, you know, everything that's on HGTV that, you know, I could just start fixing and flipping everything in the DFW market. But the reality was I really had no background in sales or marketing or cold calling or any of those things. And so I really struggled trying to get deal flow early on. Uh, but what I did have was some capital to deploy. 
And so the more I was in these rooms, shaking hands and meeting these people, the common themes were uh, I either need a deal or I either need money or sometimes I need both. And so I was able to fill a gap with uh, some lending opportunities. And that's really how I started to accelerate my education by leveraging the relationships. So once I had my skin in their game, then I could ask really pointed questions about what they were doing because it was my money at risk. And so I approached those relationships with, hey, I'm happy to to help you out, but I'm going to be a really needy lender. I'm going to want to ask a lot of questions and I want you to teach me. So if you're not in a teaching mode in your business, then I'm not the right lender for you. Um, And so there was people that said no, and that was okay, right? I was looking for a win-win situation, which was more than just lending my money. So that's kind of how I got started. That's very insightful. And I can see on both hands of that, I can see why people would say no. And I could see also, I could see why you would want to leverage your situation there. Um, And probably now with your experience, you could also see why people might want to say no. Right. Because. Yeah. So someone, you know, like, like me, I'm already dealing with people all day. I'm already running through. I've got already got, people to manage, cold callers to manage, people staff. I've got sellers I'm dealing with and I'm running projects. And I, the last thing I'm going to want is a, lend, a lender who's going to be like, I want to be all up in this deal, all up in your business. I'm going to be like, oh, no, thank you. Yeah. Right at certain times. So I, I see both sides of that. But there's other times, like I, I actually have another lender right now who's like, I want to lend, but I want to be a part of the deal. And I'm like, okay. I'm going to make you part of the deal then, brother. We're going to do this together. It's not going to be all me doing everything. Yeah. And then and then you are just going to be over there just taking notes. No. You want to be part of the deal? Okay. Watch how many times you got to go to Lowe's and Home Depot. Yeah. <laughs> I have Let's a five-run minimum. <laughs> Let's do it together. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I'm kidding. Um, some, some of that is, uh, I mean, being part of the deal, oh, man. Better put on your big boy pants because yeah. flipping is serious. Uh, For sure. So let's unpack. You said a lot. I want to unpack some of the things that you said. Uh, and you talked about network, uh, networking groups, going, be in the room with people. So, so when you're new to this, okay, a lot of people – Either there's it's almost either one or the other. So people come into real estate with no money and no experience, or they end up coming in with money, like with with enough money to be a lender. Like it seems like there's not a lot of middle ground. It's like either you come into real estate kind of after you've made your money and you can lend some and you want to invest, or you come into real estate to make money and you don't have any yet, right? Right. And so in both of those worlds, let's take, let's split them apart. Number one, if you're a newbie, you have nothing, you have, you don't have any money. How do you act? How do you approach people in a room, right? When you're out there hustling for deals and you're looking for a lending partner, what do you need to bring to the conversation in the room? Humility. Okay. Okay. That's probably the greatest factor, right? Because people are going to come into the the networking rooms um, and as they should, they should be leveraging their natural skills and abilities, whether that is in line with what they're currently doing in, with, in whatever industry they're in um, or just what it comes natural to them, whether that is they can build rapport with people whether that is they're very analytical and they can understand numbers very quickly and weave through spreadsheets very quickly, whether that is they know how to set up systems and processes for an organization or a team, or whether that is, hey, I sell solar panels door to door. Oh my gosh, (laughs) I need you in my life because that's something that I'm not good at, right? So if you're new and you don't have money and you don't know where to begin, build relationships. It's just like kindergarten, right? Everybody's in the same room together trying to find and make friends. That's it. 
And I'm hearing something that you're saying that may not be obvious to other people, so I want to point it out. You're saying know your strengths and be able to communicate what you're good at to the people in the room. Correct. I love and that, that. may that may be very difficult because I struggle with that myself. Again, my background in the military and healthcare was not heavily leveraged with sales and marketing, right? And so I I kind of had to take the blinders off as I'm looking for new opportunities and relationships. And I really had to find out, man, what am I actually bringing to this relationship? You know, for me, luckily, I, ha I did have a little bit of capital, That's a but I was still point. struggling like, man, I have all of these things that I can, you know, all these accomplishments that mean absolutely nothing in real estate. Mm. And it's cool. I could say the greatest hits, but somebody in those rooms is like, oh, how are you going to help me? Like, that's great. But what are you bringing to the table? And so as I started to learn that process in my mind, I was like, Oh, I got to figure out where my strengths actually lie. I love it. That, that is great advice. Great advice. Because this happens to me all the time. I go into a networking group. I go to a real estate meetup. You, newbies are coming to talk to me and I'm like, do you have deals? Are you doing cold calling? Like, what can you do? What are you doing? Like, and I just got to sit there and like give them 10 questions for me to even figure out like, okay, how can I even help you? Cause I don't know what you know or don't know how much education you have in the real estate space. I don't know what your, uh, your infrastructure looks like. I don't know if you even have know how to operate a spreadsheet. I don't know anything. So if you, if you could, come up with something that you can have conversations around you when you go and you shake somebody's hand and it, it probably should look like this hey what's up man my name's james wells um and uh so if i'm a newbie right my name's james wells and uh i come from a, a background in healthcare, uh which makes me really good uh at having empathy uh, for And I, so I, I think I may be able to be really good at having empathy towards sellers who are in a bad situation. So what what do you do in the real estate space? Right? Exactly. That little sentence right there will give me a whole lot of insight about you. So now right. we can have a conversation. Right. And that was so for me with the healthcare background, man, all of my marketing efforts was trying to pour that empathy into an email text or letter mm. like trust me here's all of my background i've uh, cared for people for all of these years and you know if it was a probate list i was going after they would crumble my letter up write vulture on it put it back in the envelope and send it back to me and i was like oh that really hurt um obviously uh, I touched a nerve with them i need to reread my letter and figure this out so those skills don't always directly translate. However, they help you immensely because just like you said, absolutely, I'm empathetic. I have to build rapport for people to trust me with their health care and the choices to take care of them and their family. That definitely does correlate. You just have to figure out how to navigate that in a new environment. It has to be communicated differently. Correct. It, it, so in our world, empathy usually shows up as active listening. Mm -hmm. And so a person who is empathetic and is a very good, is very skilled at active listening can learn how to do sales great in our world uh, of, of real estate investing. And they also can a lot of times be the partner in these real estate transactions that keeps the uh temperature of the situation down right because a lot of times things get highly stressful and there's usually a hot head or two in the group or or uh there's somebody very emotional and and the person who who is coming with the 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 empathetic uh wisdom <laughs> embodiment of 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 yoda uh can can be a really really important partner really important yeah. uh and it's you know if you're dealing with i mean especially bigger deals when you start getting multifamily when you start getting real estate uh i mean uh, mobile home parks campgrounds millions of dollars are at play people's uh emotions are up here so i love it man and knowing that that it like and if you think about that it's like 
that is like not a stretch of like, so just look inside, know what you can offer to the world and, and learn how to communicate it before you start going to real estate meetups. And, and, and I mean, this is great advice. So um, how do you network if you're, if you're a little bit more than a newbie, if you're coming to the group and you've got several hundred thousand dollars in your uh, retirement account and you're looking for people to lend money to, because that's a different angle. Yeah, for sure. If you just and start telling everybody you got money, that might be an issue, right? That Yeah, that that's going to be a big issue. And it's kind of like, when do you pull the curtain back for the big reveal? Um, because there are plenty of folks out there looking to take advantage to people that just have money and don't have a skill set or don't have a knowledge base, right? And so again, back to my analogy of treat it like it's kindergarten, you're still looking to find friends. Now you just know what your friends are looking for, okay? So now you're looking to find the people that have a little bit of a track record in their deal flow, in their projects completed, and what kind of niche they're in, fix and flip versus buy and hold versus short-term, mid-term, long-term rental space, whatever the case may be, and have a general idea of the types of deals that you would like to deploy your funds into from a timeline standpoint, as well as from a return standpoint. And so uh, there are so many different opportunities within real estate that you could have a short-term return in less than six months, or you could have your money being held in a deal for over two years. Neither one is bad. You just have to figure out how you want to diversify the deployment of your funds. There's pros and cons to both. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. Um, so I've seen people with who want to be lenders, uh, or and, you know, in a part in a, in a real estate meeting, a lot of times it's like raise your hand and say what you have to bring to the table, or what are your needs, or whatever. And I've seen new newbies investors come in and be like, I got a million dollars I'm trying to give away. And I've literally seen them. And then I just see like, and I know the people in the room and like, yeah. I see, and I'm like looking and I'm like, Oh Lord, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because like yeah. I know some of these people are not uh, at the same level of eff efficacy as some of us. And I'm like going, Oh my God, this dude. Yeah. That's and, a, and that's a setup. Know, if he just said that out loud, he does not know how to vet a deal, right? Right. Or even, all right. So, yeah, I've seen that happen. Um, well, so you navigated your way into this space of being a lender. So let's go through a couple of things. Mm -hmm. For you, what is like the meat and potatoes? I love to do this kind of deal. What does that look like for you? Uh, I think that changes with the market right and so if you asked me that three years ago it was drastically different than what it is today right now i like shorter term gap loans right uh, because i can get a little bit better return than a first position fix and flip loan um, it's usually shorter which is good depending on the deal that i get into um, and i can get in and out and turn that money over faster and so as long as i have good relationships and partnerships um, that I can continue to put those funds into, then that's kind of where I'm at right now versus, you know, I've still got money parked in uh, syndications as like a limited partner. Um, I've still got money parked in high end flips that, um, or excuse me, high end new builds that due to the market right now, those funds are tied up while they're still trying to figure out what their new exit strategy is going to be. Um, and, you know, of course there's, there's really short term stuff like uh, transactional lending for double closes or earnest money deposits. But um, again, those are more relationship based. I haven't networked a ton with wholesalers to build those types of relationships. Um, so right now for me, it's, it's really just gap loans. All right. So gap loans is the bread and butter right now. Explain to us what that looks like. So, cause there's a lot of people who don't know what a gap loan means or is. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, I didn't know what it was until I was in it, right? So my first gap loan was me as a private money partner on a flip. Somebody came to me and needed money. 
Um, and they said, Hey, I, you know, you bring the money, uh, as well as fill the gap, which was everything above and beyond what our private money lender was going to put into the deal, uh, which included the carrying costs, any overages, you know, everything other than the acquisition costs. And so gap loans are just that they're filling a void that either the private money lender or the hard money lender or the investor themselves don't bring to the table. And that's typically overages in your rehab. You know, if it's a four month project and now it's become an eight month project, well, all of the cost of utilities and, and insurance and all those other things, that money has to come from somewhere, right? And so typically someone can ask for, you know, I need X number of dollars to fill this gap. Well, you have to take into consideration what's the overall leverage in the situation because everybody's appetite for risk is different. And so whether that's, you know, 80% loan of value, 60% loan of value, as far as what the the borrower has in various forms of loans as it compares to the overall value of the property. Um, And so, I mean, we could have a conversation just for that uh, for a long time. I want to break down a little bit of how that typically looks. So that tip, at least, let's just put private money lenders aside. Mm -hmm. Most investors, when they start and they want to go get a flip, they don't have private money lenders that are going to fund a two or $300,000 flip project. So they're going to get hard money. Right. Hard money comes from somewhere like uh, my investor loan is one. And I, I always talk about them because I use them a lot. So let's just stick with that. So sure. they'll lend you hard money on a flip. Here's So here's where the gap money comes in. They're going to lend you, let's say, of the purchase price. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to lend you a hundred percent of your rehab budget. Right. Here's the catch. So you start off with the purchase price, 15% in that example, 15% short on the money. Right. Well, you're actually are shorter than that because they don't, give you any money towards the rehab until you pass your first rehab milestone Mm -hmm. and they do an inspection of your rehab. So you might have, so let's say you're going to go into a house that's gutted and you're going to need to do plumbing and drywall, you know, mechanical work. Uh, And so they're not giving you any money to get that started. They're not giving you any money until your demo is done, your plumbing is done, and your electrical is done, and some of your other mechanical work is done for your HVAC and stuff like that, venting. So they're going to say, okay, get those things done, and then we'll reimburse you what you have paid to these vendors. So so, – when you're first starting, you might think, okay, I'll get those things done. I'll get my vendors to invoice me and then I'll get the money from the hard money lender and I'll, I'll pay my vendors. No, no, you won't. You have to show the hard money lender that you've actually paid these vendors. Yep. You have to show them proof of receipt, a check that you wrote. Okay. So you have to show that it's been paid. So now you're 15% short on your purchase price. And you might owe $10,000 to your plumber, $10,000 to your electrician, a few thousand dollars for demo. You might owe $25,000. So you start out of the gate a lot of times $30,000 or $40,000 short. That's where you need a gap lender, right? Yep. Yeah. And that that could look like a private money partner as well to come in as the gap lender because then if you paper it up right, then they're on the deal with you. Um, and so they can bring their funds and then you guys figure out what the split's going to be on the backside versus just a true private money lender for the gap funds. Um, uh, because then we got to talk about how we're going to collateralize and, and provide security to that lender outside of that actual asset. So let's talk about the, the private money partner, as opposed to just a lender. And mm-hmm. let's, let's make it clear what those two different things are. Sure. So with the private money partner, the borrower comes to you and says, hey, I need these gap funds for this flip that I'm doing. 
Would you be willing to partner? And we can talk about what the equity split on the backside is going to be. I need you to provide all of the funds that the hard money lender didn't uh, provide during that uh, during that that project. And so, you know, one thing the borrower should be asking the lender is, can I see some proof of liquidity so I know that if we get in a jam and the budget gets blown, how much of a backstop do we have? If you tell me you, you can bring 50 and you've got like 50 in an account, that we've got no margin for error, right? And so how that's going to look too is both of you are going to be on the contract. You should be on the contract for that purchase because then you are both taking title as well. And so that's where you are secure in that deal. You should also then have a joint venture agreement between the two of you about what the backside of the deal is going to look like uh, before things go south because they will. Uh, in, in some way, shape or form, it's not going to go how you envisioned on the front side. So when you say on the contract, when you say take title. So let's talk about the take title. If if I'm a flipper and you're a private money partner, mm -hmm. we're going to we're going to both be on title. So how does that protect you? Let's just say, how does that protect you if you're on title? Because it is I am on the deed. Whereas if I'm not on the deed and the deal goes south, my J our JV agreement can get shot up in court. Um, and maybe I, I'm not as securitized. Uh, I think I just created a new word. I'm not as secured in that transaction as what I had originally thought versus if the title was transferred, I'm on the deed. I am the rightful owner of that property as well. Which means you then have some decision-making power and, and, you have very clear pathway to recoup your investment. If you just say, you know what, we need to just sell this for and cut our losses or break even. And, and all of that should also be written out. So correct. I would, so I structuring deals with the private money partners should go like this. Plan a is to sell this is to put this, to finish the project, put it on the market for, $335,000, okay? And inside of plan A, we will drop the price once every two weeks by $1,000 up until six months. And then at six months, we're gonna go to plan B, which is gonna be either be, let's start to look to refinance the property and turn it into a rental of either long-term, mid-term, Airbnb, sober living, whatever it may be, or, Let's sell, let's put it up for a fire sale and let's just sell it at what we got into it and move on and do another deal together. Right? Yep. Yep. And then there should be a plan C, which spells out if you take the route of a if you take the route of <laughs> doing the fire sale, well, what if it don't sell at a fire sale? And then okay, you're gonna force me turn it turn it into a rental. Okay, how does that look? Am I going to remain a partner through the length of the rental? Right? You see what I'm saying? Yep. Are you going to refi me out at that point? Who's going to maintain the property? Uh, how am I going to get paid off? Because I'm not going to get all of my money potentially. So um, all of that needs to be spelled out. And guess what? If it is, you're probably not going to have that big of a problem because expectation, expectations have been set properly in the front end. Yep. And so let's make that as opposed to what? As opposed to this. Hey, Paul, I got this freaking smoking deal in this in the, the best neighborhood in town, in the best school district in town. There's no way this thing's not going to sell for $365,000. I'm going to get this I'm going to get this house on the market in 3 months for sure. My crew's ready to start tomorrow. Right? That is not the right way. Nope. That is the absolute wrong way to to go to approach a lender to sell them nothing but what is it people call it hopium, like opium. <laughs> You're selling hopium and optimism yeah. and none of the realism. Right. Yes. Yeah. So 
this is a great learning experience for people listening of how to approach a lender and the difference between a private money partner and a private money lender. Now, when you're operating in a deal like that as a gap lender, as a private money lender, you're not on title. How is how are your funds protected? Hopefully by another asset. Um, that's that's choice number one for me. Uh, you got another piece of property, a uh, vacant piece of land that its value uh, is worth more than the loan that's being provided. And you put a lien onto that property. That's that's ideal. So um, I've done a couple of those in the past few weeks. Um, and that's definitely the way to go. Um, you know, typically all of the things that I look for are a personal guarantee from the borrower, which means if all else fails, you're going to guarantee that you're going to pay me. Um, hopefully there's going to be another piece of property that's cross collateralized that I can put a lien on that property. Uh, I'm also going to ask for a deed in lieu of foreclosure. If the borrower defaults, we are agreeing before anything happens, before any stress is into the situation that, look, we've already got this document that says, if you default, we're just going to deed it over to me. Uh, and that's that's going to cure me of my losses. Um, and it's going to prevent a whole bunch of headaches down the road. It's not ideal for the borrower. It's not ideal for the lender, but it's a curative process that provides a lot of security because then the lender can just take over that asset and figure out what they're going to do to recoup their losses while they In, hold the asset. Including inherit the another loan that mm -hmm. they have to. So let's, let's talk about that. So let's yeah. imagine that I went out and I got a hard money loan. Um, I went out and got a private money loan whatever the case may be, to buy a property that I'm going to fix and flip, okay? And my my lender says, uh, okay, you need $250,000. We're going to give you $200,000. And I come to Paul Lutter and I say, Paul, will you lend $50,000? I need another $50,000. And you say, yes. And um, so would you, and let's say I don't have any property. So, but I'm going to give you a second position, lean position on the property. Is that something you would accept? Not in isolation, not on its own. All right. So, but a lot of lenders do. A okay. lot of lenders do. A lot and of so lenders. That's where people can get in a jam, right? So that's heavily, heavily relationship based. So yes. that would, for me in, in my money, that would 100% not be a deal that I would do straight out of the gate with a new person. And it, it uh, matters how much equity is in the deal, too. Right. It you know, does it matter how much. Triple equity. digit flip, possibly. And, you know, people may be more open to it. Generally speaking, a private money lender is going. Let's let's assume that they will accept a second lien position. But whether they do or they don't, if you have a deed in lieu and, and then all of a sudden something happens and I can't make my payments to you, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I, I'm, I'm screwed. I'm whatever happened to me. And you are able to execute the deed in lieu. And I want people to understand this. You have to inherit that the first, first position. position lean hold lean. Yep. So it's not like Paul just gets the property free and clear. Now he can go do whatever he wants. No, he still has to pay and deal with paying off that original lender. But he gets all the control over the situation to do that. So now Correct. Paul gets to make all the decisions, every decision. Does he want to? Does he want to sell the house? Does he want to turn it into a rental? Does he want to refinance it? That all gets to be Paul's decision. Yep. And so oh, commonly that that gets missed or overlooked or brushed over when people are when lenders are looking at deals when they're they're new into that. So. Uh, one that I just, uh, funded yesterday was, you know, somebody that needed money, uh, on one property and they needed a second position lien. And so we collateralized it on a lot that it's got a first position lien on it. It's got IRA money in the first position from somebody else. Uh, but the amount that's owed on it plus my amount is really only half is worth half the value of the actual lot. So if I inherited that property through the deed in lieu, 
then I'm just making the, you know, six, seven, eight hundred dollar a month first lien position payment while I'm either going to build a you know million dollar house on the lot and sell it, or I'm just going to sell the lot. Yeah, I mean, you you are securing yourself very well. And I think this is going to be really in, in, informative to people who don't understand how this stuff works in the back end and how all these real estate transactions are done because it blows people's minds. It's like, man, how is somebody going to give you like $300,000? And it's like, well, I got these couple pieces of land and I'm, and I'm giving them a rights to, to basically take all this property over. Or yeah. I've got another rental house that's paid off and they get, they get a lien against it, which means basically a mortgage against it, which, which means they can now, now a lien will not give you the property back in Louisiana, by the way, mm -hmm. a lien will not in Louisiana, the remedy for an unpaid mortgage or lien, which is kind of the same thing is foreclosure. Mm -hmm. So, so let's say Paul didn't have a deed in lieu. Because because the difference between just a lien and a deed in lieu, the deed in lieu gives him the property back or gives him the property which he never owned, but now he's he's getting it. The deed in lieu gives him that. A lien position does not give him that. A lien position gives him the right to foreclose, which means he can take that piece of land, he can auction it. He, the remedy for foreclosure is auction. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then he can make himself whole. So he's going to need room. Let's say the piece of land is worth $100,000 and he's got a $50,000 lien against it. Well, he could take that to basically auction, which, which is going to be a sheriff's sale. He's going to take that to sheriff's sale and he's going to start the bidding. He's not, but the sheriff is going to start the bidding at $50,000, right? So Paul will have these two rights at that point. He can sell it. He can accept a higher bid and, and make himself a profit. Or he could be the bidder and he can write off the 50,000 he owes himself and he can then take the property back and then take the property to market and sell yeah. it on the retail market. So that's a lot of steps, but that how, that's how these deals are done. Yep. Uh, and look, you know, people that are are considering being lenders and uh, sometimes get stuck in a whole analysis paralysis. I got to know everything uh, before I can execute. You're never going to execute. Right. So you just need to know the next step uh, to, to keep things moving. Um, and security is is step one. So I would say that knowing how to properly secure a loan to protect yourself in that loan um, is one of the most important things to do. And once you do that and you know that, then you just progress your your conversations with borrowers uh, a little bit further until you find a fit that's good on both sides uh, and a deal that the numbers work. Yeah. And let's talk about the second lien position a little bit more, even a third lien position. Where you want to be at is as long as the property has a really strong equity position, you want to be able to look at that property and say, if this thing goes to foreclosure and sells on the market, is there enough money here to cover the first lien? And if I'm at second lien, the second lien, and then if I'm at third lien, the third lien, right? Because sometimes these liens are small and sometimes the equity is vast. Mm -hmm. And so you still can be protected in those situations, but there just needs to be a, an ample amount of equity available. Um, so that's your bread and butter type of deal is the gap. So if there's a secondary backup, what's your backup kind of favorite deal besides the bread and butter right now? Um, I think it would just be the, the simpler first position lean, right? Because then, you've got the the property as your main piece of collateral yeah. um, being in the first position. Um, and then at that point, you can choose to control whether or not you're going to allow um, additional liens behind you, right? So most hard money lenders will not allow additional uh, subordinate liens and that's their choice. And so that way, if things go south, they don't have to worry about 
anybody else in the 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 chomp chain of, of trying to get some cash out of this thing um and they have full control of it so you know that i want to say a word of caution to that okay so just because you don't allow on paper <clears throat> another lien if you're in first position doesn't mean someone can't put one they're just out of compliance with your mortgage and now they are that may be grounds for you to foreclose, but that doesn't mean it can't happen. Very important to know. Absolutely. If the borrower is willing to make that risk and go against what um, your terms are, um, that's a red flag. And there are companies, hard again, hard money companies out there that will check if there are any subordinate liens. And if they find them, they will immediately accelerate that note um, and you will have to pay it or refinance it or foreclosure yeah so i just I, I you know i'm trying to put everything on the table um and so these liens where you're in first position that's typically going to be a fix and flip how's that going to look uh for me personally uh i'm okay with 80 percent loan to value of the arv of like what it's going to look like on the back end so there's got to be solid comps um there's got to be solid experience like recent experience of the operator of that project in that market um, for me personally i'm not going to lend on a project that the operator is remote to the market so if they're in dallas and they're flipping in louisiana um not something i'm going to be interested in they, they need to be boots on ground in that market um and yeah so 80 percent. so if, if the borrower was able to obtain that at 60 to 65 percent of the arv good on them because then you know they can borrow the difference up to 80 percent and use that for their rehab their gap whatever they need um versus having to get multiple lenders in the deal and on those type of deals how long are you typically looking to stay in the deal uh, uh less than what's your term going to be yeah so a lot of times folks are saying oh yeah i can get this thing done in in four months or three months um and what i tell borrowers is look let's let's have these conversations now before there's there's pressure in the system let's give you enough of a backstop um to where you you can flex a little bit if things go south with the market or your rehab budget gets blown so let's set this note up even if you only need it for four we're going to set it up for six and then we'll build in uh, uh an extension period for a penalty point uh that way if the market shifts plans change something happens then you know we can push that out to you nine months let's say um with no prepayment penalty and if you still execute and you're done at four months cool yeah and i'll add that i structure mine for nine months on the front end with a extension for three months to get to 12 months in this market yeah i used yeah, to and not, i would say that i good. used to do six months the market is not the same. Houses are sitting for three times as long as they were two or three years ago, yeah. uh, three years ago, four years ago. Uh, so we start at nine months. That's our term. No prepayment penalty, no prepayment penalty with an ex with an option to extend for three months. And we'll we'll throw in, uh, you know, a point or or some sort of uh, bonus to the lender if we have to extend. Um, love it. Love it. Love it. So let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. I think we covered a lot of ground, a lot of ground with a lot of things that people don't know and answered a lot of questions, um, that of, of how this stuff works behind the scenes. So I want to shift gears a little bit. We'll talk about, um, um, what, what books are you reading right now? What's like, what's piquing your interest? What's on your mind? How are you growing? Yeah. Um, my, uh, my personal goal for the year on books was to read 15 books for the entire year. And I think I'm at like 17 or 18 so far on the year. Wow. Um, so definitely trying to blow that one out. Um, I, I would say one of the most eye-opening books for me. So if you know anything about kind of integrators and visionaries and how people's brains just naturally work in most people, uh, I'm very much an integrator. But I recently read a book called Who Not How um, that just kind of opened my eyes because as an integrator, I am always trying to figure out a process, how it works, how I can do it, how I can make it work. 
Whereas Who Not How by Dan Sullivan and Ben Hardy, uh, Dr. Benjamin Hardy, talks about don't waste your time on that. Go find the person that can do the thing that you don't have to know about from soup to nuts and just get them involved. And that way you can move on to the next thing. Um, so that was that was really eye opening. Um, and the other other book that I'm reading right now, is Fire in the Hole by uh, Bob Parsons. He's the creator of GoDaddy.com and also uh, PXG Golf Clubs. Um, so really good book. I love it. Um, I'll, I'll talk about Who Not How. I've read that. I've read a lot of other books similar to that. And what I want to say is you can't get to the next level beyond being a solopreneur until you understand that principle. You can't. Right. The only way you can leverage beyond being a solopreneur. Now I'm calling a solopreneur. You still got a few maybe uh, assistants or whatever, but right. You're still running everything. You're still doing yep. it. You can't get beyond that until you really have that concept deep inside of you. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you, so uh, who I don't need to do everything. I don't even need to know how to do everything. I need <laughs> to learn how to find the who who can do yep. that how so yeah. i love it i love it um well i want to thank you for your service absolutely well it was my honor your stuff on the wall back there it looks like you were in the navy am i getting that wrong or right no you're right i've got two flags on my wall i uh, i've got the navy and the marine corps flag because there's a unique uh, relationship between the navy and the marine corps when it comes to healthcare. care um, the marine corps all of 100 percent of the marine corps healthcare assets come from the navy so anywhere there is a Marine or a Marine unit, there is a, uh, a group of healthcare, Navy corpsmen and medical officers uh, directly attached to that unit that are taking care of everything that needs to get done for them. They're, they're in the field with them. They're shooting with them. They're doing everything that they do um, right next to them. And a lot of times you'll never know the difference because they're wearing the same uniform. So yeah, I, um, see, I see now you got the Navy and the Marine. Yep. So that's, thank you for your service. Um, my two of my great uncles died in the Navy in Pearl Harbor. Oh, wow. It was bombed. And my grandfather, my grandfather, uh, he was in the Navy and he fought in the Korean War on a, on a naval vessel right off the coast of Korea. Yeah. Bombing into Korea. Wow. Uh, so... Thank you for your service. Yes, we sir. appreciate you. And um, Paul, let's say it one more time. How do people get in touch with you? Yep. Two best ways are going to be Facebook and Instagram. So Facebook, you can find me um, on there as Paul M. Lutter. And Instagram is at underscore Paul Lutter. Well, look, man, we laid down some secret sauce today. We're going to yes, end sir. with that. We hope everybody will reach out to Paul, who, who has some criteria that he's looking for and of course if you want to learn more about real estate investing you can reach out to me we do one-on-one coaching we do all the things hit me up adios amigos thank you for listening to this episode if you're ready to level up your real estate investing journey go over to 90upchallenge.com 90upchallenge.com where we offer online courses group coaching and one-on-one coaching We hope to see you there.